Hello, and welcome to Journal Jabber, the show that's all about authors and all things dear to our ink-stained little hearts. Journal Jabber has been going for four years now, and this is one of our first shows in our new format on YouTube. You can follow us by subscribing to this channel, and I'd like to give a big thank you to the Ember Sparks channel for hosting our show. I'd also like you to take a minute to thank our generous sponsor, The Eyes for Editing, at theeyesforediting.com. Journal Jabber and shows like this would not be possible without their generous support. And you can find a link for The Eyes for Editing in the show description. I'm Angelie Rico Smith, your hostess, and this afternoon we are visiting with Alicia Sparks, who is celebrating her new release of her book, Sin Bin, and her birthday. You can find her book, Penalty Kill, which is the first of, it's the book before Sin Bin, for free on Amazon today. And that link is on dandelionfluff.com, and I suggest you go get it. I'm getting that right after the show. And that's, that's it as far as that. And I want to thank you, Alicia, for celebrating your birthday and your newest book release with us. Welcome to Journal Jabber. Hi, how are you doing? I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, we're, we're so, so glad to have you. I actually happen to like hockey, though I wouldn't say I'm an aficionado, but I used to live up in Montreal. And, of course, if you live there, you have to like oh, hockey. Yes. <laughs> you have to, it's a religion up there. <laughs> it's definitely a religion there. Yeah. Well, I enjoyed it. Got to see hockey games, but unfortunately, uh, by the time I was watching them, they were a lot more toned down from, you know, what I've heard there in the past, that they're pretty graphic and violent, which uh, I think is kind of the whole allure of it. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I'm not really sure what the allure is. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure it out myself. Um, I'm a Southern girl. I'm from Louisiana, so hockey is, is a foreign language to me. <laughs> and I um, happened to marry a Jersey boy, so that's how I ended up even knowing what hockey was. Oh, that's but, hilarious. Um, so I, I kind of feel like a fish out of water sometimes with hockey, but I'm learning a lot as I go along. And I tell everyone that I don't watch it for the fights and the brutality, but I get really excited when this happens. <laughs> I'm like, no, it's a sport, really. Yeah, it's, a, it's the, so, the intricacies of men on ice, you know, smashing each other against the glass. <laughs> prime. Well, there's something very primal about it, and there's something that reminds me of the gladiators and you know mm-hmm. all of that kind of thing. So it's a safe way, I guess, to to live out those fantasies. <laughs> you know, relatively safe. Safe for me, not for them. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're, we're civilized. It's okay. We're all civilized here. It is for the art of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you have a lot of work available. I was looking at all your books online, and I just tell me what we can expect to find in an Alicia Spark book, and what's the general kind of flavor of them. Well, they're all very hot. <laughs> that seems to be the general flavor. In fact, I was looking for some acceptable excerpts to read today, <laughs> and they're they're all very hot. There's a lot of um, very frank language, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But um, I really, uh, in spite of or maybe because of all of that, it, you know, at the heart of these books is the relationship, and I'm trying to deal with people who are not um, maybe your average romance hero and heroine. I want people who have tortured pasts and people, you know, who are a little bit older and who've gone through divorces and who've lost jobs and different things of that nature. So, in fact, with Penalty Kill, it was actually influenced when I lost, I got laid off a few years ago from a job and I was very angry about that. (laughs) And so after I got laid off, I, I just sort of started developing this character of Becca and her opening scene where she's sitting in the principal's office and is getting her walking papers um, kind of helped me through some of my anger <laughs> issues. So um, I like dealing with characters who are, you know, a little bit, you know, they've been through a lot more life than mm-hmm. um, than maybe some other characters out there. So I really like that kind of thing. And I like the conflict, the the fact that people are, falling in love again after divorce or they're picking their lives up after losing everything and you know I'm, I'm fascinated by that aspect because you know it is my birthday and I'm growing a little bit older so <laughs> we won't ask how <laughs> <get there. laughs> now I like that I really like that because a lot of I'm, I'm usually not attracted to romance because it is very you know handsome guy beautiful woman the fire starts immediately as soon as their eyes you know touch each other right. and and you know, I've been through a divorce, and I am also older now, and, and it that just does not appeal to me because it's so not true. That wasn't even true when I was a teenager, and I was all gorgeous, and, you know, the romance was right. thick. It still wasn't true. 
Well, I still have those elements in there. I like mm-hmm. to think that, um, you know, that that's the element of my books that I consider to be more fantasy. You know, I still think I live a fairy tale and, you know, I'm still a, a Disney princess at heart. <laughs> so even though life is not actually like that, you know, it's nice to, to read about a guy who sees a girl from across the room and there is that instant spark. So I do have a lot of that in the books. But a lot of time that instant spark gets shut down or it gets, um, you know, the girl will say, oh, it's just your hormones, you're just a horny guy or something to that yeah. effect. So she doesn't look at him and say, oh, this is the one. You know, there's always that level of resistance because usually my heroines aren't very sure of themselves. And even if they know that this guy is the one, there are so many obstacles to get there that um, I, I, it's not as love at first sight, you know, <laughs> typical, this is, this is my soulmate, and it's going to be this guy forever. It, it's not like that. And if it were, it would be three pages long. <laughs> yeah, so it's more of a the eyes cross across the crowded room. They, they meet. The sparks are definitely there. And then the next line is, what the hell, you're married? <laughs> yeah, something to that effect. <laughs> or, you know, you're being stalked by your ex-wife or, you know, there's, there's always something something in there. Yeah, Just, exactly. just like in real romance. <laughs> exactly. Well, or what? You didn't tell me you were a vampire. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dang it. Now that kind of changes my feelings a little bit. <laughs> but you're still pretty hot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you said that you had found uh, a, a little something that you could read to us. That it's maybe uh, PG-13? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then after the show, or well, not after the show because then we aren't here, but uh, at the end of the show, you've got something a little more smoking hot to read right <laughs> all right all right well that's your warning um all you listeners there is going to be some smoky hot stuff at the end so you might want to shoot the little ones out or put your headphones in but for right now alicia's going to read to us something a little more acceptable for everybody but i'm excited to get to the smoking hot at the end <laughs> okay. well let me set this up for you first this comes from penalty kill and right now penalty kill is free on amazon it's been free this weekend And it is a book that um, I think it's one of the best books I've ever written. And I know people always say, oh, this is my best book ever. But um, I wrote this book actually about three years ago. And it's taken me this long to to get it to the point that I wanted it to be. So um, Penalty Kill is about a woman, like I just said, she's lost her job. Uh, She has a Ph.D. in English, which, you know, is very autobiographical there. (laughs) Yeah, she's lost her job and she doesn't know what to do. So her brother is in Memphis, and he works at a place called Sin Bin, which is not an S&M club. Instead, it is a bar slash restaurant for hockey players because Sin Bin is, is the, um, the penalty box in hockey. Oh. So he works at this place called the Sin Bin, and he's very familiar with the hockey team that's in Memphis. And he says, you know what, they're looking for someone who can do some PR work for them because their coach is a disaster right now. Um, he is being very um, offensive towards the media, and if we want to make this hockey team everything that it can be, we've got to get the coach in line. So she decides to take the job because what has she got to lose? Mm -hmm. But she recalls a night, actually a weekend, 10 years ago, when she hooked up with a hockey player, (laughs) and she doesn't expect this to be the same guy that she's going to be working with. So these two characters have a history, um, but they haven't seen each other since this weekend in Vegas 10 years ago. So she takes the job, she goes to Memphis, and now this is going to be their meeting for the first time. And this scene is from his perspective. It starts, she says, I'm looking for Coach Hardaway, she said, but it sounded like she had just asked if he wanted to take her right now on top of his desk. He shifted and plastered on a smile. Good God, this woman was definitely from the South, but her accent was different from most of the girls he was used to dealing with. Yes, it was southern, but she didn't sound like she'd just fallen off a turn wagon and was looking for a quick lay with one of his players. No, this girl, dude, sophistication and education, two things he found extremely attractive. He put out his hand to shake hers and swore a spark flew between them. She even giggled a little and lowered her lashes. He needed to get laid. It had been 10 years since his divorce, just before he won the cup, and he hadn't had a serious relationship in all that time. The team took to took up too much of his time. That had to be the reason he was reacting this way to her. Besides, she was the first single woman close to his age he'd been around in a while. 
the players seem to scoop up all the ladies, and most of the ones who came around have not yet broken 30. This one, according to her file, was 36. Come in and sit down, he'd offered. He expected her to sit all prim and proper with her back rigid against the back of the chair. Instead, she sank into the leather as if it were a comfortable, familiar glove. He smiled. He liked the unexpected. He watched her take in his office space, which was huge and somewhat overcrowded. His desk sat to the right of the door. On the left-hand side was a conference table he used for his coaching meetings. At the back of the room, amongst the extra equipment, was a practice goal he'd had bolted to the floor. He often practiced with it to help get rid of his frustration. He also kept a couple of kids' plastic hockey sticks in his office because he never knew when he'd have to entertain a group of youngsters. Once a hockey player, always a hockey player. Her eyes lingered over his frame championship jersey, then shot back to him. So you won the cup? My last year as a player, it was a pretty dynamic year for the team, but I was well beyond my expiration date. Most players didn't play into their 40s, but he had. Somehow I doubt that. I just lost my place. <laughs> Somehow I doubt that. <laughs> he wondered what she meant about the comment, which sounded like an invitation of some sort. What was it about this girl that was getting him all worked up? He was glad he was sitting down. Otherwise, this little interview might get kind of embarrassing. So what do you know about hockey? He folded his hands in front of him in an attempt to look at least professional, even if his mind was 90 to nothing full of erotic fantasy. Apparently, it happens in an arena. I'm sorry, not much of a sports fan. At least she wasn't a pug bunny. He couldn't help but feel a twinge of jealousy when all the girls threw their attention at the players. He knew he should be well beyond that. He was, but every now and then, it wouldn't be such a bad thing, would it? You grew up in Texas, though. Football's big there. He sounded pretty stupid, and he realized he was grasping for something to talk about. If she wasn't into sports, she probably didn't think very highly of athletes, even if she hadn't looked down her cute little nose at him. Well, hockey's a sport of a different color now, isn't it? She used confidence, but she should, someone as smart as she was. She was imp he was impressed she hadn't introduced herself as Dr. Something or other. She kept it simple, first name only. Lost my spot again. <laughs> well, sort of simple. He smiled at her, stumbling over her name. She was cute. He didn't usually like to describe women as being cute, but she was. All the way from her chestnut hair, which he noticed seemed a little unruly, to her tiny hands. He could see this getting out of control very quickly because every time she spoke or smiled, he was thinking about the shape of her mouth and how sweet her lips were and how soft it would feel against his body. So you think you can handle talking about a team, talking about the players and the strategy to the media without knowing a thing about the sport? He folded his arms across his chest in an attempt to regain control of the situation. I'm a fast learner, she jetted out her chin. From the fire in her eyes, he had no doubt about it. There was something very familiar about that that headstrong determination. It lingered there on the edges of his memory, then faded. Let's hope you are. You're here to make things better, not worse. No offense, Coach, but I've been watching your films. I don't think it could get much worse. So that's their first meeting after a weekend a long time ago. And they both kind of sort of recognize each other, mm -hmm. but not enough to really make it click yet because, you know, they look different. It's mm -hmm. been a while. So they're both a little bit older <laughs> and totally not expecting each other. You know how sometimes you'll run into someone and they're in a place that you don't expect to see them, so you're not sure who they are? Oh, all that the time. Kind of, <laughs> that kind of situation with these two. It's like, I know you look familiar, but I can't quite place you. So that's, that's, how, um, that's how penalty kills start. And she learned a lot about hockey along the way, and I learned a lot about hockey along the way. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun. That's awesome. Now, did that actually kind of happen to you? No, I mean, not exactly like this. Did you ever have a, a situation where you were like, you, you know, you slept with somebody or whatever, and you kind of recognize them later, and you're like, huh, I know you from somewhere. No, I can't say that's that. <laughs> that part's purely fantasy. <laughs> That's funny. So yeah. That would be an interesting story there. <laughs> yeah, it would. It would. Thank goodness I, I don't think I have it in my life either. <laughs> Well, you have a lot of books out there. Are you independent published or are you traditionally published? No, I'm traditionally published. Um, I'm with Boku Publishing, and I'm also with Elora's Cave. And actually, I started with Elora's Cave, oh, my goodness. It's been um, almost 10 years ago 
when I started with them with a, a little story called Better Than Ice Cream, which is one of my favorite stories because it was so much fun. Yeah, and, I actually um, saw that cover. Um, you know, this is the yeah. whole smoking pot <laughs> alert here. I'm just going to tell you if you go searching it. <laughs> I'll have to um, tell you a funny story about that. I was so excited. Gosh, if it was 10 years ago, my oldest son was 10 or 11. And, you know, I he knows that I write things that, that he couldn't read. I was so excited to get my first cover, and my internet was really slow, so I went to download the picture and open it up, and it slowly revealed itself <laughs> a little at a time, we saw the back of the guy's head, and I was like, ooh, the back of the guy's head, and then we went down to his shoulders, and I was like, oh, he's going to have his shirt off, <laughs> and then we saw his bare bottom, and I closed the laptop, I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was like a little strip tease or something and my son was mortified and then of course I was mortified. Oh, that's hilarious. Did you did so, you have the discussion about we don't need to talk to our teachers about this at school or anything here? Yes, this please. Was an accident. Yes. <laughs> please don't tell anyone about this. <laughs> this. It was complete accident. Mommy's a good mommy. <laughs> right, right. And so from then on I was like, Okay, next time I get a cover, you're gonna have to be out of the room when it comes in and then I will preview it because I never imagined you know, I was new to the world of publishing, so I never imagined that I'd have a naked man on my first That is hilarious. That's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what's funny? Um, I saw that cover, and I actually didn't realize his back was turned. I just saw the butt. <laughs> butt <laughs> and ice cream. That's all I got exactly. out of that cover. <laughs> well, what I, um, what I requested was I thought it would be fun if the guy was holding some ice cream behind his back, and that was my cover request hot guy holding ice cream behind his back. And that's all I said. <laughs> that's funny. Well, you got that. You definitely, so I, definitely, I definitely got, got that. that. <laughs> I definitely got that. But that was a fun story. Um, this just kind of tells you a little bit about how my mind works. It never shuts off as far as writing goes. And at the time, um, my oldest son was really into some show. I don't remember what it was. It was kind of like Mythbusters, but it was with food, and they were doing food myths. Mm -hmm. And I think Alton Brown was the host. So anyway, they were talking about brain freeze and how brain freeze is um, sort of a sensory overload is what they were saying. And I said, I don't get brain freeze. I get body freeze, which is true. I don't get brain freeze when I eat ice cream. Instead, it's like my chest and my stomach tighten up and get cold. And so it just sort of went from there, I'm like, huh, I wonder why that happens with that sensory overload. That kind of sounds like something else that sensory overload. What if ice cream <laughs> could cause women to have the big O? Oh, <laughs> and then it just sort of, it sort of went from there. And as it happened, at the same time, there was this really cute guy working at a local yogurt shop, mm -hmm. and I made some sort of comment about, man, he could sell me ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> And it just sort of went from there. <laughs> That's funny. That so is really just, funny. You never know where it's going to come from. Yeah. Well, the the things that, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways, moving on. <laughs> if I, I get a feeling this conversation could go in a whole other direction. <laughs> yes, it could. <laughs> <laughs> well, what inspired you to be a writer in the first place? Have you always written? You, you've been doing this about 10 years, I think, publishing, you said, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, and um, people ask me that all the time, and the truth of it is, yeah, I've always written, but I, I haven't always been very good at it, of course, mm -hmm. and um, I don't remember when it was. It's probably been, gosh, 13 or 14 years. I sat down, and um, I've been a teacher for years, and we were on spring break. We had a two-week spring break back then, which we don't have anymore, but <laughs> we had two weeks. So during that two-week time, I wrote a 100,000-word novel that was absolute crap. It was the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. But um, I wrote it, and I thought, wow, you know, if I've got 100,000 words in here. And at the time, I started reading a lot of the trade magazines and different things like that and started, you know, looking into the process of getting published and how long it took to get published and just sort of kept bouncing around ideas and kept writing and kept writing. And I came up with the idea for Better Than Ice Cream. And I saw that Laura's Cave would give you an answer at that point. It was um, within two weeks, they would give you a yes or a no. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, two weeks, I can handle that because I'm very impatient. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so I sent them the, uh, I guess, first three chapters. 
And within two weeks, they wanted the full manuscript. And I was like, that's great, except for the fact that it's not completely finished yet. <laughs> so I had to finish it really fast. And, you know, everything just moved at light speed from then on. And, you know, in e-publishing, things move so much quicker than in traditional, you know, with your New York publishers. And that's what I found with Boku also is that, you know, things move so fast. Um, Sin Bin, which is the second hockey book released last night, and my husband said, weren't you just finishing edits on that, like, a week ago? Yeah. I said, yeah, it's been about two weeks when we finished up the edits on it. He said, and it's out already? I said, yeah, they move very fast. We go from, you know, finishing the book to three or four rounds of edits and line edits, and then it's out. Yeah. So I, I really love that. Yeah, I do too. Uh, you know, and, and that goes as that's true for indies and the smaller publishers. It's so much more flexibility, and you can right. say, "Oh, I have a great idea. I'm going to write it over spring break, and boom, it's done." Instead of the whole right. traditional slogging through paperwork and everything, I, I really think that's right. a boon. Well, and one thing that I like about Boku, I like everything about them, to be honest with you. And I'm not just saying that because they're my publisher. I've worked with a lot of different publishers. And they do a lot with us as far as promotion and setting up interviews like what we're doing now. But also, um, I have three series. One of them is this contemporary hockey series, which is fun and flirty and erotic, but it's, it's straight contemporary. Then I have a contemporary paranormal series, which is my primitive series, um, dealing with tiger shapeshifters. So it's something that's a lot different from hockey. And then I have the zombie series that I just started um, with the first book. It's called Soulbound the Fallen, and it's not a traditional romance. It's more of something that's um, suspenseful, and it's got some elements of horror in it, and it's got elements of paranormal in it, but it's not a traditional um, happily ever after type of theory. Mm-hmm. And I like that I can do all of this. <laughs> and I may say, oh, I think I want to write about this. And I'm able to do that without them saying, well, we need you to focus on one series at a time or we need you to focus on this genre or that genre. Yeah. So That's a good idea. I mean, I like that, too, for the whole flexibility because creativity is a tap. Like, we have to, like, when you're a professional, you have to be able to turn it on and get work done. We can't right. afford to wait for the muse to strike because that could take forever and then we're done. Right. But we still do have to cater to that creative muse to to some degree. And that's a really neat, I I mean, that's the flexibility is is nice. I I, I like that. It is. And some of these worlds that I go into are very dark. And especially when you're dealing with paranormal, we're dealing with a lot of really dark things, a lot of angsty Mm -hmm. people and, you know, characters that have pasts that are are really... um, very extreme you know maybe in their past they've been murderers or drug dealers or things like that and so it takes you to a different place creatively than something that is more fun and flirty like the hockey series Mm -hmm. so I'll write hockey for a while and then I'm like oh my god these regular guys are killing me I'm so sick of them (laughs) and then I'll write Shakespeare and I think oh my gosh they're so angsty (laughs) you know I just want to write about a cowboy (laughs) and then I'll write about you know a cowboy yeah so but, um, you know, I'm a Gemini, so that means that I, I have a hard time focusing on any one thing. And I get bored very easily, so I like the fact that I can switch genres like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, and one thing that you brought up earlier <clears throat> that I think is interesting is, like, writing is therapy. I know I did that one time. I had a boss that I just absolutely hated, and it wasn't just me. Everybody hated him. <laughs> they, in fact, the employees would plot on how to kill him, but in that <laughs> that way that you're joking, but you're not. Right, right. <laughs> and so, and he had just reached this point where I, I don't cry very easily, and I'd actually cried at work a couple times. So I came back, and I wrote this story, and it involves a baseball bat and his head and teeth fragments <laughs> and blood, and it's a mess. And I felt so much better after that. And every time I saw him, I'd just give him the biggest smile and I'd be like, because right. I know what happened to you. I mean, in my dreams, but it's still just as satisfying. Is that, and you said that that's how you started um, your hockey series, was kind of right. a therapeutic. Do you still do that? I do. And if I were to tell you the full story, we'd be here all day. But <laughs> <laughs> at, at my most recent job, <laughs> you know, being a teacher is not a whole lot of fun. 
And um, there are there were some very strange things going on at this school. Like we would come in and our power would be cut, and then we'd come in another day and our water was cut. Oh, wow. and I'm like, what is going on here? Our principal lives in this multi-million dollar house and drives a Lexus, and he's a principal. And so, you know, my imagination starts mm-hmm. running wild. Well, one day we had a meeting after work, and we're all like, oh, God, another faculty meeting. This smoking hot cop comes <laughs> to talk to us about school safety. So I'm sitting there taking notes, and I took like six pages of notes that day. And then I came home and immediately started plotting a book about school safety and a school shooter and different drug gangs that are operating inside a school. And the principal is very much <laughs> patterned after my guy who, you know, um, is, is living in this big house and driving this fancy car. And I'm thinking, you know, I can make those imaginary connections. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it makes me feel better about myself. <laughs> And in the end, you know, it's all, it's not, you know, all in fun, but it is very therapeutic, Mm -hmm. you know, how these different things come together. So, yeah, I do still do that. And we have this this saying as writers that if you've ever turned me on or pissed me off, you're probably going to be in the book. (laughs) (laughs) And that's definitely true. (laughs) That's funny and and very true. It's that, that there's a line in a movie and I can't remember what it was but uh, he says you know I'm going to eviscerate you in fiction and I think we have all done that (laughs) yeah and it's you know and I'll have friends who will send me messages and they'll say you've got to kill me off in one of your books and I'm like I don't really kill people off that much in my books and they're like but I want to be this seedy you know pimp or drug dealer and I want to be this really bad guy and you've got to kill me off and I want to die like this Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you put way too much thought in. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what. Why don't you cut me off in the parking lot and maybe clip my phone for a little bit when I'm having a bad day, and you'll get that. <laughs> All right, you'll, you'll get there. <laughs> That's funny. Well, what would you say is one of the biggest challenges to this genre? Oh gosh, just everything really. There are so many challenges, and there are things that you don't even realize are challenges until you know, uh, a while down the road. Um, With the hockey series, I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to write hockey. And then I encountered Ryan (laughs) O'Leary, who plays hockey. And he said said to me, he had the nerve to say, have you ever actually seen a hockey game? And I thought, dude, really? (laughs) But he he was right, though. And he said, you know, so many things that you're saying are just wrong and you're off track and you're the way you're you're calling different things is just wrong. And so he really taught me what I needed to do and how things you know, the the hockey slang and the lingo and he said, you know, we're gonna make you the best hockey writer out there but it was very painful (laughs) at first. Yeah. So, you know, things that I didn't even realize that I was doing um, were things that were wrong. And it's the same thing with paranormal because even though we make our own rules, um, people want it to be believable. And one of the reviews that I got for Primitive Fix, it's going to stay in my head forever because you know the bad reviews I always do. But um, my hero is a tiger shapeshifter and my heroine is a wolf shapeshifter. And the review said, how are a tiger and a wolf going to mate? Come on, this isn't even possible. And I was like, shapeshifters, none of it's possible. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, she was right, though, is that we have to, even though we're, we're creating these fantasy worlds, we still have to have it make sense some way. And it has to be, even though it's not logical in the real world, we have to create a set of rules that, that are unbreakable that will work. And that's something that's really difficult no matter what genre you're dealing with. Just make sure you get the details correct. Mm -hmm. And if you say that something's going to happen, you have to be able to back that up. And it can't be just, oh, miraculously, this tiger and wolf were able to mate with each other. (laughs) Yeah, there has to be something more. (laughs) Right. Um, What's better than ice cream? I got a review for it that said, you know, this is great and everything, but the FDA would never approve it. (laughs) And I'm like, it's fantasy. That's so funny. Said, you know, do you realize the testing that this ice cream would have to go through before it could be sold in sites around the country? And I'm like, okay, yeah, you're right. You're right. Oh, <laughs> you know, why did I not think about FDA testing? So, yeah. you know, 
things that you don't even think about. People who read the books and who turn around or review them are definitely going to call you out on mm-hmm. them. So, yeah, I and I would. Say, yeah. Oh well, you know, it's my book. I can do it however I want to. That doesn't fly because our readers are a lot smarter than that. So. Yeah. Well, do you find that you rely on your editor and your beta readers a lot for that to give you the feedback of that's not, you know, that's not really possible, that's not ringing true for me? Um, I do, but I try not to put too much on them. Um, with the hockey books, for example, um, Ryan was very busy with um, with his book. He had a new book that came out this weekend in the Red Hot and Boom series. Mm-hmm. He and Fable Hunter did. So he's been really busy, and he told me um, in advance that he wasn't going to be able to edit Send In for me. And he said, but I'll look at the hockey scenes if you want me to. So I polished the hockey scenes the best that I possibly could because I didn't want to disappoint him. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I highlighted those and sent them to him so that he could read that part and make sure I had it you know, as as correct as possible. But I try, um, especially if somebody's told me something in one book, I try to make sure I don't make that same mistake in the next book because I want everything to be as clean as possible. Right. And, you know, I did get from him, great job. This is much more believable than the first go <laughs> So Hi. I was thrilled to get that. And I'm not trying to make him sound like he's hardcore or anything. He really taught me a lot about mm. writing hockey and did definitely make this so much better. But, um, you know, I try to catch as much of that as possible. And then the things that I don't catch, either the beta readers will catch or the editors will catch. And then I'll make a note of it. Don't ever do this again. <laughs> yeah. So, no, well, I, think that's, that I think that's commendable because a lot of, I mean, it is wonderful on one hand with the new publishing industry. I mean, the changes that have happened, that it, it can just be so quick and so flexible and creative. On the other hand, there is a lot of work out there that is highly substandard. There's a there's a few books right. that I've read that I thought, did you not know to use periods and capitalization? This is a book. Yeah. You yeah. know, and so it is, I think that's commendable for you that you do hold yourself to such a strict standard because our readers, they don't want crap. You're not going to get readers. This is the new flash of the show. You're not going to get readers if you put out crap. <laughs> right. You know, which you would think isn't a new flash, but... <laughs> But, you know, um, we all do still make mistakes, and I'll read something that I wrote. In fact, just pulling out excerpts for something, um, just reading through what I just read, I thought, gosh, you used this word way too many times, so (laughs) close together. You know, so I'm constantly, if I sat and waited for the book to be what I thought was perfect, it would never, ever see the light of day. But on the other hand, you can't put things out that, that have really big issues with them. Mm-hmm. But something that I've discovered, I am, I'm really picky and I'm really hard on other writers. And I don't know if it's because I'm a writer myself or what, but I started reading a book the other day that I had gotten, and it was first person present tense. And I had just first paragraph, I was like, I'm not going to read this. And that's a personal um that's a personal choice that the writer makes and that me as a reader, I make that choice that I don't want to read something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it could have been the best book ever written. I just can't wrap my head around. I am walking through the door and looking out the window. It drives me crazy. Yeah. So, and on the other hand, I also have issues with books that, um, where every chapter is written from a different character's point of view, and it's because I have trouble following along. It's yeah. nothing wrong with the writing style itself. It's just that I have a hard time because I don't always look and say, oh, this character is from this, you know, this chapter is from this point of view. Mm-hmm. So even if we all have the best books possible out there, you're still not going to be able to please everyone because we all have those little quirks and different things that that we um, have issues with. You right, know? right. Yeah, and I would agree with you with that. That's that's completely true. Um, one of the things that I'm always curious about is the the M word, which uh, for I don't know what you're thinking it is, but <laughs> in, in this show context, it's marketing. Uh, a lot of oh, yeah. writers just absolutely hate. I think it's like probably 97 percent or more. You know, I ask, you know, what what is your marketing plan, or or you know, how how are you with promotions? And the answer will be, ooh, I don't, I don't really like it. How, how about you? What, what's your approach to it? 
Um, I don't like it either. <laughs> and But I think I've realized why I don't like it. Um, this whole weekend has been all about me. Um, and it's been, you know, yesterday I had a full day of different blog takeovers and interviews. And today I'm doing a, um, an online birthday party on my uh, Facebook page. And now I'm talking to you and it's all about me, me, me. Mm-hmm. And a lot of writers don't like to draw attention to ourselves. (laughs) You know, I I can talk to you all day about the characters and that kind of thing, but whenever you start, you know, asking me, well, what makes you a good writer or what makes you this, then it's one of those things where I'm like, I don't know. I I don't have the answers to those things. And I think that marketing um, really puts the focus on us as people. And you may say, well, no, it doesn't because you're promoting your books. But in doing that, we we have conversations with people we wouldn't talk to. And, you know, Mm -hmm. it's all about us. I read a quote the other day. I wish I could remember it. It was something to the effect of how, um, you know, people who are creative don't like to be in the spotlight. It's it's kind of that double-edged sword where we crave the spotlight and we hate it at the same time. Yeah. And I think that marketing is, is one of those things that feels like a spotlight. I've gone to different conventions and conferences, and I've done panels, and I've done readings with an audience there, and every time it just makes me sick to my stomach because it's it's so nerve-wracking, yes. and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I don't want to talk in front of these people. I don't want to stand in front of a group of people and tell them about publishing or about my book because it's, it's something that um, draws attention to us as writers. And, you know, I think as a whole, we're kind of shy people, really. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not all of us are, but <laughs> I, well, I think that the ones of us that aren't are probably faking it. <laughs> right. And, you know, my husband was listening to me do an interview one day, and he said, you know, you turned it on just like nothing, and you were laughing, and you were talking. I said, I was faking it. <laughs> I was pretending it's, as because we're, it's because we're so nervous. Yeah. Um, I, I heard a great story about Sherilyn Kenyon about um, so one um, conference that she attended or something, and um, she had showed up wearing all leather, and she had a whip with her, and she had these buff guys walking around in their little leather underwear, and she, like, put on a show, and I'm thinking, I want to be Sherilyn Kenyon, yeah. but then at the, same, at the same time, you know, wow, does that draw attention to you, you know? Yeah. So it's a double-edged sword. I'm thinking, do I really want to draw that attention to myself? And then I'm like, yeah, I probably would. Yeah. Well, in a way, maybe that's easier, though, because you're you're more of a character then. And, you know, right. maybe being an actress, playing the part of, because I'm sure she doesn't run around like that at home. And oh, it's right. us, exactly. you know, <laughs> we need to write about her. <laughs> right. Well, and it's like I see pictures from um, there was a big conference in New York this weekend, and or maybe it was last weekend, and I saw pictures of E.L. James, and you're just expecting her to be, you know, looking all naughty and everything. <laughs> and she doesn't because she's not playing a role. Yeah. <laughs> who she is. What? She's a so, regular person? <laughs> right. She's a regular person. In fact, the first time I ever saw her picture, I thought, no, <laughs> that's not a yell day. Come oh, on. that's funny. <laughs> She's because like way we're racier than that. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. She looks like she could be my BFF. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Well, that would probably be more true than uh... <laughs> Well, speaking of naughty, um, I promised towards the end of the show that you were going to read us something a little spicier. So anybody, this is your like little three-minute warning. If you have kids in the room, put your headphones in. We cannot be blamed. <laughs> you have been warned. Um, but, yeah, I'm kind of excited to, to hear something a little more smoking hot. Though that last passage, that was pretty smoking hot, so I don't know where we're going from here. <laughs> well, I'm still trying to keep it somewhat clean. Um, I have this one labeled as hotter scene. <laughs> um, again, this is from Penalty Kill, and Penalty Kill is free this weekend on Amazon. Um, it is the first of the Memphis Mayhem hockey series, and this scene actually takes place Ten years ago, when Nick and Becca first met each other, and it doesn't—it's not um, the way the book is set up. It doesn't give you a, a prologue. I mean, this isn't part of a prologue, is what I'm trying to say. This is something that um, she's thinking back on and remembering what had happened when they first met. Mm-hmm. So this is a start. So get your little ones out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> 
Sin City. It was incredible. The lights, the food, the music. Their first night there had been a whirlwind of light and sound. They arrived on a Wednesday and didn't think the town could possibly get any busier than it already was. However, Thursday night, the streets were littered with people and confetti as the local team won the Stanley Cup. She didn't know a thing about hockey and had no idea Vegas even had a team. Apparently, they did. And someone thought it would be great if the team stayed in the same hotel she and her friends had saved for three, to, for three years to stay in. Big, loud guys roamed up and down the halls, yelling in every language imaginable. She'd stepped out to tell them to shut the hell up when she'd come face to chest with sex on a stick. She wasn't sure who'd made the first move or what exactly happened, but her weekend in Vegas got a hell of a lot more interesting. For the next few days, she and Axel, as he called himself, didn't leave the hotel room. They ordered in and had the most decadent, most amazing sex she'd ever had. This was what sex was supposed to be like. This was what she had been missing all those years. And the things he had done to her, the things she had let him do to her, she reddened every time she thought about giving over that kind of control to someone. But it felt so right letting someone else take the lead. She didn't know if it was his personality or his profession that made him so adept at both making her body do whatever he wanted it to do and blowing her mind. When she left to go back to the real world, she knew she'd never find another guy who could rock her socks like Axel had done. They hadn't exchanged personal information beyond what was necessary, but they had connected on so many levels it was insane. When she finally settled back into her life, she came to realize that every guy she met from that moment on was compared to a set of blue-gray eyes and a wicked smile, not to mention the rest of the package, and they all came up sadly short. Austin had taken to calling him the standard because he knew Becca had created this fantasy guy no one could ever live up to. He was the standard by which everyone else would be compared, and she hadn't told Austin the reasons why. She had just filled him in on the physical aspects of the man with the blue-gray eyes. You should choose a safe word, Axel had said, his voice gravelly and very dangerous. It was their second night together, and she'd shared with him the night before how much she wanted to just hand over control of her life to someone else. That can be arranged, he'd smiled. As he tied her hands and ankles to the bedpost, she wasn't sure what she was getting herself into. What's a safe word? I'm going to push you to your limits. Part of the fun is that you will say no and stop. I want to know when you really want me to stop and when you really mean no as opposed to when you're just saying it in the moment. Does that make sense? His face rested just above hers and she could tell he was serious. She licked her lips. What kind of word? She'd never heard of anything like this before. Then again, she'd never been tied to a bed before either. Something you wouldn't ordinarily say during sex, not oh God or that's too big or anything like that. She had giggled because both of the phrases were appropriate. I won't start until you think of something. She racked her brain and for the life of her couldn't come up with anything that didn't sound dirty. Like any word? Yes, something you'll remember and know to use when you've had enough. And what happens when I say it? She didn't want the fun to stop just because she had second thoughts. I'll give you a few minutes to be sure you really mean it. I'll stop doing whatever I'm doing unless you think. If you want to keep going, you let me know. If not, then we try something else. It's perfectly safe. What if I'm on the verge of a climax and I say it? He kissed the tip of her nose. Try not to say it if you're that close. He ran a finger down between her breasts and flattened his palm just below her rib cage. Have you thought of anything? Parlay? Par what? He wrinkled his forehead. Parlay, it's part of the pirate's code. It means you have to give me temporary protection. You can't abuse me on your ship. He laughed. Pirate's code? Is every woman obsessed with pirates? She smiled. As long as they're the right kind of pirates, then yes, we are. So parlay. Parlay it is, then. He moved and ducked his head between her thighs. So that's that one. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> Little bit of a Johnny Depp obsession there. <laughs> wow. In fact, the first go around mentioned Johnny Depp in that scene. And uh, Ryan O'Leary said, I'm sorry, but <laughs> you don't mention another man's name when you're about to have sex with someone. And I was like, okay, maybe I'll take Johnny Depp out. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Wow. So. Well, I am so glad that this is up for free. I've already actually downloaded it while you were uh, good, good. reading. <laughs> good. <laughs> and it's doing phenomenal. I just, let me click back over. Yeah. Um, penalty, penalty Kill uh, was number one on the Amazon bestseller rank for romantic erotica, um, genre fiction number 27, 
and 187 for in the Kindle free store. So this this book is doing phenomenal. Um, yes, I it's very exciting. Yeah, everybody go search it up, go find it. And now the cool thing is we know book two is out as of yesterday. Yes, it is. And um, the exciting thing is if you're into hockey, you know, this, this upcoming week, the Stanley Cup final start. And um, I wouldn't be a true hockey fan if I didn't say, let's go Rangers. This is the <laughs> first time the New York Rangers are in the Stanley Cup finals in 20 years. And um, it, it's going to be a very exciting week at my house. And if the Rangers lose, it's going to be awful. And if they win, uh, my husband will probably cry. <laughs> <laughs> you ever seen a, a six foot two guy cry over hockey? <laughs> you know, it's so much sadder than a child crying. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, he grew up with hockey and this has been his team ever since he was a, a little guy in New Jersey. So, um, in fact, we brought our um, almost four-year-old son home from the hospital when he was born wearing a New York Rangers outfit. So <laughs> oh, hilarious. That is so funny. So we're hoping that the Rangers will, will take the cup, and that would be just awesome. Yeah, well, I hope so, too. And, and now we know, too, um, for all of you hockey widows who may be bored by the whole process, <laughs> Yes. you can sit there and read, is it it's Sin Box? No, Sin. Sin Bin. Sin Bin, thank you. Sin bin, yes. which now I know what one is, and it's Penalty yes. Kill. Penalty Kill is free on Amazon today, so you better hurry. And then Sin Bin has just been released, so you've got two of them, and that should occupy you during the game, I think, if you're too It really boring. should. It really <laughs> should. And, you know, if you need some guys to look at, Henrik Lundqvist of the New York Rangers, he's a goalie. They don't get any hotter than that. <laughs> I am, I'm going to go look now as soon as I uh, – I think I'm going to be reading this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> Oh, good, good. I'm so glad. Well, thank you so much, Alicia, for visiting with us here on Journal Jabber. Um, happy birthday. I mean, this is thank kind you. of an, an awesome three-part show. We have a free book. We have a birthday to celebrate. We have a book release, you know, <laughs> right, and, right. and the Stanley Cup. So it doesn't yeah. get any better than this. <laughs> well, I want to thank all our listeners for tuning in, and I hope you've enjoyed our show today. Um, I remember to subscribe to the Ember Sparks channel, which is our new format here on YouTube. And you don't miss anything then. And I hope you'll join us next Sunday as we're going to chat with Catherine Rhodes. And I don't know how smoking hot it'll be, but I don't think you get get more smoking hot than this show. <laughs> so thank you so much, Alicia, for being with us. And happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. And we will hear from you all next week. Until then, keep your pen to the paper, your fingers on the keyboard, and your mind in high gear. And we'll jabber with you later. Good night, everybody. <laughs>